It's September 9th, 1896, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. I'm sure all of us have at one stage pondered the question of how the world entertained itself before monster truck rallies and demolition derbies. <laughs> well, we here at Retrospectors HQ have the answer for you because it was on this day in 1896 that Joe Conley, aka Head on Joe, staged the first of scores of events that made him famous, a high-speed collision between two steaming locomotives. And Connolly, or Head on Joe, which, as you say, he became known by, is indeed in the Guinness Book of Records for having wrecked the most trains in a career, 146. <laughs> <laughs> so he was a showman dedicated to the spectacle of train crashes. <laughs> but although this was the first day that he'd ever crashed two trains together deliberately for an audience, it wasn't the first time that it had ever been done. No, a few months earlier, an Ohio railway conductor called A.L. Streeter staged the first ever pre-arranged rail collision for entertainment, crashing two 40-ton freight engines at 50 miles an hour just outside Columbus, Ohio, to an appreciative audience estimated at 18,000. And seeing this, Connolly realised that he had the means to do the same thing, but better, because the thing with Connolly is he was born in 1859 and he'd grown up in Iowa during this post-Civil War railway boom which galvanised previously very sleepy swathes of the country, including his own. He had worked for the railway briefly as a young man and then ended up in Des Moines as a theatre manager. So most people have thought there's no way to combine my two passions, <laughs> but most people were not Joe Connolly. He realised he could do the same thing, but he could apply his showmanship skills to make it bigger and better, and he did. I found this wonderful quote from him where he said, I believe that somewhere in the makeup of every normal person there lurks the suppressed desire to smash things up. <laughs> Which, to be fair, I mean, you said, you know, how did people used to entertain themselves before monster truck rallies? I went to a monster truck rally this summer, uh, albeit it was in the south of France, not America, so it was kind of a pale imitation of what you'd really want to see. Mm, le monster truck. <laughs> it, was, it was brilliant. After every stunt, the guy went, Formidable! Uh, <laughs> le monster truck. Truck American. Um, but what the entertainment on offer for my two boys, who love this kind of thing, was watching a car that had already been crushed get crushed again by another car and being right. close to that action. So things haven't moved on all that much, really. No. And the perfect staging ground was just around the corner because it was about to be the Ohio State Fair. And as the newspaper, the Des Moines Leader, put it, the fair management is of the opinion that nothing in the line of pumpkin and threshing machines would compare with a wreck as an attraction. <laughs> Yeah, so Connolly approached the State Fair Board in Des Moines and offered to put on this crash for $5,000. That initial price was a bit too steep for them, and they came back with their own offer, and they said, we'll, we'll let you do it for 3000 plus a cut of the ticket sales, which I must say could have ended up in his favour. Mm -hmm. And so the board agreed to let it go ahead, and on the day, 5,000 people paid 50 cents each to sit in the grandstand. So it did end up in his favour, didn't it? I don't know what the costs were, obviously, but 5000 in half, that's $2,500, isn't it? Plus the three grand for putting it on. He's, he's $500 in front. Well, OK, I can give you all the uh, <laughs> the money made on <laughs> Let's the Let's pour over <laughs> all of the production receipts from 1896. That's what's really interesting about two trains colliding. <laughs> <laughs> How much popcorn did they sell? <laughs> I can tell you in just one moment. Okay, so so they had uh, 5,000 people who had paid their 50 cents, but they had thousands more who stood along the fence outside yeah, who had just way, come, and I presume, yeah. No VIP gold circle for me, just a special brew and stand at the fringes of Hyde Park. <laughs> right. But <laughs> consequently, it meant that the event had boosted attendance to the State Fair itself. So the cost of smashing the trains together was 8500 which works out to about $260,000 adjusted for inflation. But because they netted more than 10,000, I meant that Conley made over 3,500 personally, which works out to about $110,000. Yeah, more than 80,000 spectators turned up to witness the crash. I mean, obviously it had the benefit of being held at the State Fair, which people were already going to anyway. And with a disregard for safety that makes the modern blood run cold, one newspaper <laughs> reported that in the immediate aftermath of the collision, thousands of people made a mad rush for the wreck and swarmed over it for relics. This is what's <laughs> part of the attraction for people, isn't it? 
wasn't it? It wasn't just seeing the crash, it was actually seeing if anyone would be injured. Are these two engines going to collide together and create a fireball? Is part of the ironmongery going to fire off in people's faces? That was part of what you were going to see. And also that sense of danger was heightened by the fact that they put in these lifelike dummies in the locomotives. So even though the engineers themselves had jumped off the trains once they set them going towards one another, it looked like there were still people on board. But it's not as if the two engineers jumping off when the trains had reached 50 miles per hour was a picnic in itself. I mean, that is a stunt that you can't really practice (laughs) for, isn't it? And so, yeah, the job on offer from Mr. Connolly was, we'll lay a stretch of track, usually anywhere from about 1,800 feet to a mile long. We'll get two old decommissioned steam locomotives. (laughs) We'll put them at either end of the track facing each other. You will pull the throttle back as far as you possibly can to get them up to speed, and then you will jump out at the last possible moment. Anyone interested? I mean... (laughs) You know, that is real proper daredevil stuff, isn't it? Because you're going to be near the train when it crashes, whatever you do. So at this point, it looked like America had a new favourite craze. But then six days later, something happened that really, in any sane world, ought to have killed this whole thing dead. An even more ill-thought-out stage train crash took place. This was called the Crash at Crush, and it was named after its organiser, William George Crush. He was a railway passenger agent for the Missouri, Kansas and Texas Railroad. Terrible bit of nominative determinism. Yeah. (laughs) I know. He convinced his bosses that a staged collision was just the thing to advertise the railway. I mean, it's back to the Dole Air race again, isn't it? I mean, that was weird because they were advertising tinned pineapple in a death-defying plane race. (laughs) But at least it wasn't planes. I mean, in this case, we've got train company. (laughs) I mean, they weren't advertising two planes crashing into each other (laughs) to advertise air travel. (laughs) So a temporary town was constructed to stage all of this 14 miles outside of Waco, Texas, and it was named Crush after its founder. The railway laid on special trains of the non-colliding variety to ferry (laughs) spectators from across Texas to the site, which became a bit of a carnival in and of itself. You know, there was stalls and games and shows and food vendors. And also they had a wooden jail set up because you really know you're going to a salubrious event if there's a temporary (laughs) jail on site. (laughs) The statistic I love was that at the time of the collision, Crush was in fact Texas's second biggest town. That's how many people were there to work. (laughs) Yeah. It's incredible, isn't it? And the crash at Crush was staged pretty much like the collisions that had gone before, but in a vague gesture at safety. Each of the two engines were pulling six coaches, and these had been chained together in an attempt to stop them flying off on impact. And spectators were told to stay 200 yards away from the site, but because twice the expected 20,000 showed up, police struggled to keep the 40,000 strong crowds back as the trains departed. They collided at 45 miles per hour and both boilers exploded, something that engineers had assured Crush would not happen, sending thousands of red-hot fragments of metal hurtling through the air. And these killed at least two spectators and maimed countless others. Yeah, we have a photo of the exact moment of collision taken by a guy called Joseph Dean. He was blinded in one eye by a flying bolt as he took the photograph. A Civil War veteran who was there said it was even more terrifying than the Battle of Gettysburg. (laughs) And yet, this was tremendous publicity (laughs) for the idea of crashing trains for entertainment. Yeah, Crush was fired immediately by executives in the aftermath of this horrible accident. We're not using him again. I've got this guy called John Trainwreck. He's going to be brilliant. (laughs) (laughs) Well, here's the thing. They rehired him the very next day as it became clear that the publicity stunt had succeeded. (laughs) The attention was outweighing the fact that two people had been killed. Well, that's probably what made way for the fact that Conley then went all around the country, staging more and more of these shows, credited with having staged more than 70 collisions that destroyed at least 146 locomotives between 1896 and 1932 because in the 1930s it really started to wear off. This is now the time of the Great Depression and I think that people really felt that it was kind of distasteful to be wasting perfectly good trains. And that was despite the fact that Connolly did strive to keep things spicy over the decades. He would paint adverts or political slogans on the trains, or he would fill cars with gasoline so they would immediately burst into flames. This is impact. the problem. Once you make yeah. a name for yourself by being the man who's crashed more trains than ever, like what do you do for the crowd that come back to the state fair next year to see it again? And, it, and the answer is put hot <laughs> yeah. coals in it, put gasoline over everything. Put the name of your political opponent on the train. So the last one ever was back in Des Moines, Iowa. And in that one, the crash took on an election theme. So one of the trains said Hoover, one of the trains said Roosevelt. And the footage exists on YouTube. We've put it in the show notes today, so check it out. It is astonishing. 
you can see the crowd and their dogs, bizarrely, running first towards the trains as they crash into each other. And then when realising, oh, we've paid to see a really dangerous thing, we should get the hell out of here, running away from the train crash they've just run towards. (laughs) But Joe apparently, by this stage, having seen scores of these things, apparently his final words as he saw this collision were, well, that's that. (laughs) And then he just walked away. That was kind of the end of his career. My favourite was the 59th train crash. You've never met (laughs) him. He peaked. (laughs) Next time... If we had been a group, we would have fought to be a group or we would have broken up as a group. Love the show? Support the show. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.